The West is heading into another drought while Asia and other parts of the world are drowning in record rainfall. Climate change? Yes, but this video is not about climate change. It's about how to help your landscape survive water conservation efforts, so let's get started. Climate change has been going on since the worldwide flood 12,000 years ago. That's one reason that many people were more nomadic in times past. Our modern culture prefers to remain stationary, so we need to adapt to our local environments, which are usually affected by numerous factors, including how many people need to share the resources. I'm going to take a moment and chat about concepts and perspectives to help lay a foundation for understanding why certain decisions need to be made about your landscaping and your timer programming. When it comes to finite resources, we need to consider how much there is, how many people need to share that resource, and for how long. Is this resource a life source or a luxury? It's a life source. Is what you're using it for a life source or a luxury? For you, it's a life source. Washing your car is a luxury. Food supplies are a life source. Landscapes are a luxury. If there is a choice between irrigating your landscape or having water to drink to survive, we'll choose drinking water. In some areas of the U.S., lawns are rare or outlawed. In the spring of 2021, the governor of Nevada signed a bill to ban non-functional turf. We don't know how long drought conditions will persist, and we can't assume their cycles will be predictable. Therefore, we should be proactive and unselfish. But don't expect others around you to fall in line. This only creates unwanted tensions. Just set a good example and respect your neighbors. Now let's begin. Here are some things that can help you with your timer programming decisions. Moisture probes. Moisture probes are used to manually check the dampness of soil. You can purchase these at most garden centers or online. I have them available through my resources page linked below. Moisture sensors. Moisture sensors detect the moisture in the soil and will shut off your timer or certain zones depending on the model of timer and probe being used. But I have found that most landscapes can vary wildly between soil types, shade, and other factors. Just because it's wet enough in one area doesn't mean it's going to be the same in another, so I prefer to depend on visual decisions. That is just my preference. I'm not saying don't use them. Air Troll and Hunter make REN sensors and mini weather stations. The mini weather stations, including Hunter's Solar Sync, adjust your run times according to the current weather conditions. Wi Fi timers and smart controllers can connect to local weather stations and adjust the timer programming according to the weather, but how close are those weather stations to you? Is that data going to be accurate enough for your location? Maybe, maybe not. Many municipal areas will have water restrictions. Be sure to take full advantage of the days and times you can water if you're concerned about losing your landscape. All too often, the watering guides provided by municipalities, water districts, and well-meaning organizations recommend 10-minute run times per station and don't consider what type of watering device you're using, such as whether it's drip, drip sprays, rotor sprays, rotary sprays, or pop-ups, so they usually recommend 10 minutes. With a Rainbird 1800 series nozzle, that calculates to a quarter inch of water. In comparison, a Hunter MP rotator nozzle would need to run almost four times as long to match that. A Hunter PGP ultra rotor spray would need to run twice as long as the standard pop-up to achieve that same saturation rate. And drip lines vary, but you get the idea. 
Be sure to download this handy rule of thumb sheet to help you with your timer programming. Coverage. Bad coverage leads to longer run times. When a lawn has inefficient coverage, the norm is to typically run those lines longer. The reason this has some merit is because once the water saturates the soil where the water is reaching, the subsequent water will begin translocating. Translocating is the movement of water through the soil. To avoid the need to run the system any longer than necessary, proper coverage is needed. The most optimum coverage you can typically expect is only 80%, which can be obtained using rotary nozzles. I discuss these in the video shown here. Otherwise, it'll be 60 to 75%. This is optimum, not normal or average, because normal or average systems have not been designed or installed with scientific care. Most systems probably only attain 30 to 50% at best. So how do we get those percentages? Well, those are based on distribution uniformity, or DU. DU is derived from a system of water distribution measurements and calculations, which I won't go into in this video. The procedure is called water auditing, and I've done auditing as a certified landscape irrigation auditor through the Irrigation Association. Just one of the manuals for getting certification is 276 pages long and full of industry jargon. So suffice to say, I won't cover this material in detail here. Here are a few other things to consider. Microclimates. Most properties have microclimates. These are small areas around the property that have more or less shade. Different soil types, different grades, different plant or tree types which have more or less watering needs. Ultimately, plants and trees with similar watering needs should be grouped together in these microclimates. It's ideal to have an irrigation system designed to accommodate these microclimates, but it's rarely ever done. Shade versus sun. Sometimes you'll have a single lawn or flower bed in which half of it gets more sun than the other half. This sun-shade scenario can vary throughout the year. Ultimately, the irrigation system should be designed so the sun and shade areas are on separate lines, but that is rarely done. Programming. Especially during drought conditions, there is the need to cut back as much as possible on the watering schedule. How much can you dial back the run times and frequency before it becomes a danger to your landscaping? One of the easiest ways to learn how little water your landscape can take and still survive is to do the stress test. Cut back your run times and days per week as far back as you dare, then observe each day how everything's doing. Then adjust the run times and frequency accordingly in incremental steps. This is all objective, so it's up to you how much you adjust the timer. There are no magic calculations or so-called experts that can give you a guaranteed set of programming numbers. There are plenty of scientific methods available to get close, but you still must observe and adjust due to the many factors involved. In our industry, we tend to stick to rules of thumb since we can't be on your property every day and we can't reasonably take liability for the possible negative effects of giving incorrect advice based on our best guesstimates. There are so many factors that play into the decisions. Weather changes. Set it and forget it is the most common method of programming timers and it permeates the landscape maintenance industry as well, since most so-called professional gardeners haven't learned how to program timers or don't want to take the time to reset the timers regularly based on the weather. In my former gardening business, I made it my business to take ownership of my client's irrigation systems by changing the programming according to the weather and inspecting the system about once a month. The time to do so was built into the monthly maintenance price. I will go into more detail in a future video geared toward the green industry on this. Set it and forget it is a major money and water waster. 
That's why if you don't want to manage the program yourself or can't because you're away from the property, many weather stations or smart controllers can help with those adjustments. Seasonal adjustment. Some timers like hunter controllers have a seasonal adjustment option that allows you to change all the station's run times incrementally up or down to accommodate the weather changes. This way you don't need to go to every station on the timer and change each one throughout the seasons. The way it works is that you set each run time as if it were the hottest day of the year. Then as the temps go up and down, you simply adjust the seasonal adjustment accordingly. This is a great feature, but I like to keep the run times the same so they can water deeper. My favorite way to adjust things is to simply change the frequency of the watering. In other words, change how many days a week it waters. Now you have two ways to quickly adjust the watering. Document it. Most of the properties I encounter don't have any documentation regarding their systems. None. This frankly blows my mind because for one, how can you program your timer at all if you don't even know which zones water which areas of the yard? And taking in consideration what type of watering devices you have, like whether they are standard pop-ups, rotors, or drip. They all have different runtime needs along with other factors. Most of the time, I must spend part of my first visit just to document these things and then program accordingly. I have a free download that can help you with this documentation. I will be going in more detail on documentation in a future video about documentation and inspections. Programs A, B, and C. I don't want to confuse anyone out there, but since you're trying to be conservative and keep your landscape alive, I need to briefly explain how that can be done by using the programs available on your timer. If this section is too confusing, just ignore it and just keep everything on program A. On your timer interface, you'll see a program button. This is for setting certain zones that share common water needs to be grouped together. Here's a common example. Your sunny lawns and water needy plants can be on program A so they can water like hmm, three times a week. Your shady lawns and established plants and trees can be on program B, so they can water hmm, twice a week. Your fruit trees may only need water once a week, so they can be on program C. Be sure that you document this to be sure that none of your zones will be attempting to run at the same time as other zones. Time of day to water. It's usually best to water in the early morning before the wind kicks up and the sun evaporates the water. Give the water a chance to soak in. If you water at night, you risk an overabundance of weeds and other wanted things in your lawns. So, if this has been helpful, remember to like and subscribe. Click the notification bell so you'll be notified when more of these helpful videos come along. In conclusion, we've gone over the perspectives of water use priorities, factors that contribute to your programming decisions such as your property's microclimates, and we discussed how the set it and forget approach is a big water and money waster. Then we went over the need to document your system and programming. Finally, to figure out how little water you can get away with using, do the stress test. Download the free documentation sheet and the rules of thumb sheet to help you with your programming. You can get many of the timers, sprinklers, and other irrigation supplies that I've spoke about through the resources link below. Are you in a drought situation where you live? If so, what are your water restrictions? Let me know in the comments section below. See you next time.